Then Moses made Israel a set out from the, the Red Sea. And they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it in, in the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then when they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. All right. Well, good morning, uh, Grace Life. It's so uh, good to be with you this morning and uh, being able to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, if you could just pray with me, I appreciate it. I want to pray before we get into God's word. Father, thank you, Lord, for the grace to come before your people and open up the word this morning. Thank you for everyone that's uh, listening and tuning in today. We pray that your spirit would teach us the truth. Your spirit would give us your comfort and your peace and your grace. May we come to understand you more as our healer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're visiting us for the first time, uh, we're currently in a series entitled Hope Has a Name, Exploring the Names of God. And we're looking at the different names of God in the scripture and what they reveal about who God is and how we're supposed to live as his people. Today, we're going to be looking at the name for God that comes out of Exodus chapter 15, Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord who heals. In order to understand this name better, we have to unpack the story of our passage today. Uh, right before the passage uh, where the Israelites encounter the, the spring at Mara, uh, they were delivered miraculously by God from the Egyptians. You may recall that he sent the 10 plagues to them and uh, he parted the Red Sea so that they could cross over in that dramatic fashion onto dry land on their way to Canaan. God's people were on their way to the promised land. It was a land filled with milk and honey, a land of blessing, of goodness, and prosperity. However, we're told that right before they reached the promised land, that they have to go through the wilderness. In verse 22, Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. The wilderness is a hard place. It's barren. It's desolate. God's people were beginning a long and arduous journey in order to get to the promised land. And just three days into the journey, they find themselves in some real trouble. In the second part of verse 22, we're told they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? You can imagine Israel's disappointment. It's hard to go much more than three days without water, especially in the desert. By the third day, people are getting desperate. They're thinking, if we don't get water soon, we're going to die of thirst out here in the desert. And just when they're almost completely dehydrated, they see out in the horizon an oasis. They get their hopes up. They rush to the, the, the water, and they drink from it, only to find out that it tastes bitter. It, it tastes nasty. It's undrinkable. And so they call that place Mara, which means bitter. Now, I'm not for a second downplaying what the Israelites are going through here. Uh, during spring break, uh, one of my college years, me and a few buddies, we went to the Grand Canyon and uh, we hiked down. We, we camped the night and we set up tent and then we hiked back the next day. But we were, we were, geniuses. Uh, between the five of us, uh, we only brought a few sandwiches and a few bottles of water. And the next day back on our hike up, which took about eight hours, 
uh, we had run out of water about halfway into the hike. And we had to hike the remaining part of the Grand Canyon without any water. That was not fun. Here the people had gone three days without finding any water, and this was a real emergency for them. But I want you to notice their reaction. Keep in mind, they just experienced a miracle in which God showed them he had power over water. God had split the Red Sea so that they could cross over it. God had demonstrated that he was the all-powerful God, that he could command the seas to part, that he had power over water. And at this point, they should have cried out to God for help, asking him to give them water. But instead, they complain and grumble to Moses. Now, Moses was their leader, and it was completely appropriate for them to take their concerns to him. That wasn't the problem. The problem was their attitude. To put it bluntly, they were whining. They were complaining. They were grumbling. You see, children are notorious for whining. The Israelites complaining and whining was a sign of spiritual mature, immaturity. You know, one day they're dancing at the beach. They're, they're singing praises to God, that, that God had set them free from slavery. A few days later, they are on the verge of breaking down. They're on the verge of rebellion. This was a clear sign of their spiritual immaturity that spiritually speaking, they were just like children. Now I have two young kids at home, ages 10 and five. And as children are prone to do, uh, there's whining going on at my house. Some days are better than others. And I don't want you to get the wrong impression. My kids are great and I, I love them, but there's times where they whine. And um, their whining is a, a clear indication of their spiritual immaturity. However, to be completely real with you, and to be completely transparent. My kids aren't the only ones whining and complaining right now during this time. What does it say about my spiritual maturity if in their whining and complaining, I start whining and complaining? You hear what I'm saying? I'm sure during this quarantine period, there is no shortage of complaining, whining, and grumbling going on in your households as well. Now, there's no judgment. There's no condemnation here. Um, and if I'm overgeneralizing, if you're part of the 1% where there's absolutely no complaining or grumbling going on at your home, praise God. Send me an email and tell me I'm wrong. Um, but my, 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 my hunch is during this season especially, um, our hearts are prone to complain. Our hearts are prone to grumble. And what we need to see is that complaining, a complaining heart is an indicator of where our hearts are at. And there's a few ways we can think about Israel's sin here. Number one, they were forgetful. God had just delivered them from Egypt by splitting the sea just a few days before. God had demonstrated he had amazing power, power over water even. Truly, he could have made it rain. Truly, he could have directed them to another stream but they don't ask, they don't seek God. Instead, they, they complain and they grumble. So they were forgetful. Secondly, they were selfish. God had just set them free from 400 years of slavery, but their attitude was, what has God done for me lately? They were ungrateful and they were immature, but their deepest spiritual problem was their lack of faith. They simply didn't believe that God would take care of them. They didn't trust in the faithfulness of God. Now, I want you to listen closely at this point. It's not a sin for us to bring God our problems. In fact, he invites us to do so through prayer. And it's, it's not wrong for us to voice our pain or to voice our frustration or our anger even. We see that throughout the Psalms, that, that the psalmists and David frequently bring their frustrations and their hurt and their anger even to God in prayer. However, it is a sin to have a complaining spirit that poisons our communion with Christ and that poisons the waters of the relationships around us, making them bitter. The Israelites, for them, the, the, the problem 
was water. They, they needed water. However, God wanted them to see that their main problem wasn't on the outside. It was on the inside. It was the dissatisfaction and the grumbling of a complaining heart. The problem at Mara was not the water, although the water was bitter. The problem was the bitterness in the hearts of God's people. John Calvin pointed out that God might have given them sweet water to drink at first, but he wished by the bitter water to make prominent the bitterness which lurked in their hearts. In other words, if God had simply given them sweet water to begin with, they may not have seen the bitterness which was resident inside of their hearts, but because of this water problem, this water shortage, the bitterness of the water at Mara, what came to surface was the complaining heart of the Israelites, the, the bitterness in their hearts. And what we need to see is that bitterness doesn't come from our outward circumstances, but from our inward response. See, you and I, we're, we're called not to grumble. We're commanded not to complain, but to believe in the goodness of God, even when he leads us to bitter waters. One of the reasons that we trust God is that he can turn something that's bitter into something sweet, which is what happens here in the story. In verse 25, Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And it says, he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. We can learn from Moses' example. When he's confronted with this desperate need, he didn't grumble. He didn't bicker back at the Israelites who were complaining to him. He took their troubles to God in prayer. He knew there was nothing he could do to save God's people, but he knew God could save them, so he trusted in God. When Moses cried out to God, his one little prayer accomplished more than all the complaining of the millions of the Israelites that were complaining by the streams at Mara. It accomplished more because it was directed to God in faith. God showed him a piece of wood, a tree, and he directed him to throw the tree into the bitter water. And the wood made the water sweet because it came from God. This was a supernatural miracle. Now, what's remarkable is not that God was able to perform the miracle at Mara. That's not the remarkable thing. We know God's capable of performing miracles. What's remarkable is that God was willing to do it for a bunch of forgetful, selfish ungrateful people. You see, God's grace is so abundant that he even provides for a group of complainers and whiners. And that is good news for us because we are just like them. We are just like them. You see, to understand this story, we must see the connection between the Exodus story and the gospel story. The story of the Exodus is that God delivers the Israelites out of slavery, and he, he takes them to the promised land. It's a land of goodness. It's a land of plenty. It's a land of prosperity. However, in order for them to get there, they must travel through the wilderness. God takes them through the wilderness not to save them, you see. He's already saved them. He's already delivered them from Egypt. He takes them into the wilderness in order to show them what's in their hearts, and cause them to grow in maturity, to become more like him. That's what the Bible calls the process of sanctification. He didn't take them through the wilderness to save them. He took them through the wilderness to sanctify them. And that's the same pattern for you and I as believers. God saves us from the sin of slavery and, and death, and he saves us in order to take us to our promised land which is to be with him for all eternity in heaven, worshiping him, enjoying his goodness, enjoying his presence for all time. However, in the meantime, here on earth, you and I are on a journey that will often take us through the wilderness. It's a long journey. It's a difficult journey. And often it's a, a painful journey. But through it, God wants to reveal our heart to us so that we can repent and that we can grow in faith so that we can undergo the same process of sanctification, so that you and I can become uh, spiritually mature believers that can reflect 
the goodness of God and trusting God. Uh, after he turns the bitter water into sweet water, God gives his people commands to, to obey. And he gives them this promise in verse 26. He gives them the promise that if they're obedient to his commands, that he will be their healer. He will be Jehovah Rapha in the Hebrew, which means I am the Lord, your healer. See, I'm convinced that the Lord wants to heal much more than just what's on the outside of our lives. He wants to heal much more than just the circumstances of our lives or our physical bodies. I'm convinced that the Lord wants to heal us on the inside, that the turning of the bitter water into sweet water wasn't just about healing for physical needs, but it was to demonstrate that he wants to heal our often bitter, complaining, grumbling hearts. In exchange for bitterness, he wants to give our lives a sweetness that comes from fully receiving and trusting in the grace and the mercy of God through Jesus. Notice that it's a piece of wood. It's a tree that God commands Moses to throw into the water that turns it from bitter to sweet. Can you think of another piece of wood that brings healing into our lives? Well, can you think of another piece of wood that brings redemption, that brings hope, that brings salvation, that turns bitterness of sin into sweetness and goodness of the grace of God? Well, trees are significant in scripture. From the life-giving tree of the Garden of Eden to the very end of the book in Revelation where we read about the tree of life and the leaves that are for the healing of the nations. But most importantly, the tree on which Christ was crucified is what heals our bitterness, is what heals us from our sin. And God specializes in trees of healing. And he demonstrated that through the cross. God is our healer through the cross. And so today I want to invite you to pray in response to his word. All of us are going through this COVID pandemic together, going through the isolation of quarantine and social distancing together. And in the midst of it, I don't know what your particular wilderness experience is. Maybe some of you are unemployed. Maybe some of you are going through um, the uncertainty of a business right now. Maybe it's a, a physical sickness you're going through. Maybe it's relationship struggles in your life that are, are making the, the waters of your relationship around you bitter during this pandemic and it's putting even more stress upon you because of the isolation. I don't know what wilderness you're going through right now. But the good news of God is that his grace is available for you. His grace is available for me, just like it was available for the Israelites as they were grumbling and complaining the bitterness of their hearts. You see, God wants to take the cross, that piece of wood, and turn it into sweetness for your life. If you would just come to him with your heart today. So I want to invite you in response to the word today, just to come to God in prayer for a moment. And just begin to lay your heart before the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal your struggles, to reveal the sin in your heart, the, the grumbling, the complaints, the ways in which you're not trusting him. And just begin to lay that before the Lord today. Lord God, I thank you so much that you are Jehovah Rapha. You are the Lord who is our healer. Thank you for your abundant grace. Thank you for your abundant mercy, God. Lord, um, we know that there's a lot of growing for us to do. We know that you've saved us and we are on this journey to 
heaven, our promised land, but in the midst there are great struggles, there are great temptations, there are great difficulties and challenges, God. And as we face those, our hearts can turn inward and begin to become frustrated and angry and even begin to become bitter. But Lord, we want to lay that down before you today. May we receive your grace. May we receive your love and your forgiveness, God. May you turn the bitterness into sweetness today by your mercy demonstrated on the cross on our behalf, Lord. May you continue to shape us and mold us into the kind of people you desire, Lord. Thank you for the journey. Thank you for the wilderness, God. Help us to trust you in the midst that you will provide everything we need. You will provide the living water that we need so desperately in our souls today. Thank you when we bless your name, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen.